You have reached the Geek Elite. Good luck. Video games are a unique medium. They can tell stories. Immerse us in strange, fantastic worlds. Blur the very boundaries of our reality. But at the end of the day, video games are fun. Whatever fun is to you. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I am Matt aka Stormageddon. And on Fun and Games, we talk about the history, trends, and community of video games. It's a celebration of all the games we play and all the fun we find within them. And there's so many more games out there. So we hope you'll share in that conversation with us. Fun and Games podcast with Matt and Jeff. Find us on certpov.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And happy gaming. In my lifetime, I expect to see three, four, perhaps even more women on the high court bench. Women not shaped from the same mold, but of different complexions. Welcome back to another episode of United States of Women. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm Elizabeth, and this is Jessica. Hello. And this is Geek Elite Media's Women's History Podcast, where we introduce you to the women you never knew you should know. The, yeah, the women you never knew you knew. Yeah. There. <laughs> so, season four, we are in the Peach State. Georgia. Georgia. Down in Georgia. Um, and this week, we're going to talk about the best Girl Scout. The best? The best Girl Scout. There's been so many, though. Well, I think, I think you'll come to agree. So what do you know about the Girl Scouts? Um, I know I almost... Tried well. My mom tried to have me be one, but I was way too introverted to do that. So um, that's and, okay. And I got kind of asked to leave, so it's fine. <laughs> At least I didn't get kicked out. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's like I, I'd hate to say it's like the girls' version of the Boy Scouts, but it's it's survival skills and all that for, for yeah. girls. Yeah, I mean that's that's essentially what it was intended to be. Um, I don't want to get into too much about the Girl Scouts because it literally does track with our lovely lady for today. Okay. But yeah, no, I mean, I think I think everybody out there has had some interaction with Girl Scouts, if nothing else, to buy the cookies. Yeah, the cookies. <laughs> That's I mean, interaction. they are our drug at they're our drug dealers <laughs> come January, <laughs> <drug> February. <laughs> Um, just like the Boy Scouts and their popcorn. Like, it's just, it's, yeah. Anyway. And most everybody's had a Girl Scout in their family. I feel like it's one of those things. Actually, no, I don't think I have. I'm trying to think. But introverts, really. Uh, fair. <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah, no, I, I was a brownie for a while. And then we had a change over in... Uh, troop leader mm. and you clashed did you clash we clashed oh so it was just kind of decided i could spend my time doing other things mm -hmm. <laughs> but in any case we are going to go back to october 31st 1860 oh okay all right so on that date Juliet Gordon Lowe is our lovely lady. Was born Juliet McGill Kinsey Gordon. Ooh. Say that three times fast. In Savannah, Georgia. And she was named after her grandmother. And her nickname growing up was Daisy. 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 So <laughs> <laughs> she got the nickname from her from her uncle. She was the second of six children. Okay. Her dad was a cotton broker. All right. And her mother's family helped to found Chicago. Like the, the city? city? Yeah, the city of Chicago. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this is going to be important for Juliet's childhood. Okay. Because... It's 1860. Uh-huh. We're in Savannah, Georgia. Uh-huh. So we know what happens next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at six months old, her dad left to join the Confederacy to fight in the Civil War. 
Yeah. <laughs> Again, Savannah, Georgia, 1860. Yeah. <laughs> um, as Sherman began his march uh, to the sea mm-hmm. and got close to Savannah, Georgia, her family fled to Thunderbolt, Georgia, her mom and her siblings. Okay. Turns out, General Sherman Mm -hmm. is a family friend. Knows her uncle on her mom's side. Well, that was that was a civil war. (laughs) Families fighting family. So he began to visit them frequently at Thunder during the campaign out to the sea as he's burning everything. (laughs) So how how's life? (laughs) As my soldiers Um, burn your hometown to the ground. Uh, but Sherman arranged for Juliet and her siblings and her mom to have safe patch- passage to her mom's family in Chicago. Well, so they nice. moved to Chicago. And upon getting there, she contracted brain fever. So meningitis? Basically. <laughs> <laughs> meningitis, either meningitis, scarlet fever, something along those lines. Yeah. Um, brain fever, apparently, because I had to look it up, I was like, I have no idea what the heck brain fever like, is. Ah, our head's hot. <laughs> <laughs> basically. Yeah. Basically, it's an inflammation in the brain of some kind that presents as a fever. Yep. And it's apparently only used in, like, Victorian literature and, med- and yeah. medical Bas- basically books. Basically, before we knew what germs were, we were like, well, your head's hot, so... Brain fever? (laughs) Basically, yeah. So uh, she luckily recovered without much in the way of uh, long-lasting issues from that. Yeah. Um, Then uh, President Johnson issued the amnesty proclamation, so her dad was officially allowed to join them in Chicago, and they all moved back to Savannah together to the family home. Okay. Uh, this is where Juliet and I have some serious things in common. Okay. Okay. Um, she was apparently extremely accident prone as yeah. a child. Yeah, that, that sounds about right for you. <laughs> With several injuries and illnesses and just general... Did she, did she hit herself with a shot put? No. However, <laughs> her mother did write in a letter, Daisy fell out of bed. As usual. As usual. And I felt that to my core. (laughs) One of the things that this general accident prone caused Mm -hmm. is she ended up with a prolonged untreated ear infection due to a grain of rice. I still, I could not find anywhere how the rice, I, all it says is prolonged untreated infection and a grain of rice but in any case it left her get a grain of rice in her ear and she got an infection or did she eat a bad grain of rice i don't know it led to an ear infection (laughs) i had so many questions but i couldn't find an answer (laughs) what does this mean (laughs) but in any case it left her almost completely deaf wow yeah which she struggled with the rest of her life Particularly because it caused her to have other illnesses more readily and frequently. Yeah, because she has an infection. Exactly. Uh, She, being of the class that she was, she attended numerous boarding schools up and down the East Coast, Mm -hmm. north and south, left and right, all over the place. However, she did not particularly enjoy her studies. Well... Like, Being deaf, uh, is yeah, probably. I imagine her teachers weren't that great at that time. <laughs> yes, well, and on top of that, at least some of the historians uh, suggest that she probably also suffered from possibly dyslexia or some other. Well, she had a brain fever when she was really young, so I imagine that messed up her neurological development quite significantly. So, uh, yes, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised, but in any case. Despite going to the best schools throughout her life, she constantly had grammatical and spelling errors. Again, I can 100% (laughs) empathize with this. I am fortunate not to have dyslexia. I just can't spell. (laughs) In any case, 
uh, she far more preferred art and poetry to mm-hmm. her studies and was not considered a good student. And I won't believe that. But she managed to graduate in 1880. Well, she did it. She did it. She, she did, did it. it. She passed through. I wonder if she had seizures, actually, from her brain fever. Could be. Like, not your typical, like, full body shake seizures, because they come in different things, but, like, her constantly being clumsy and stuff. Or That's, some sort yeah. of, like, inner ear imbalance. Well, she also had an ear infection, so, like... Okay. So, like, any of these any things, things could have contributed. <laughs> The wonders of not having modern medicine. Yeah. Uh, growing up, she was called Crazy Daisy. Aww. Uh, frequently for her eccentricities and her tendency. The, the line from her uncle in a letter is, you never knew what Daisy was going to do next. You just knew that once she decided she was going to do it. <laughs> That sounds like you. (laughs) (laughs) So um, several things she did during her formative years is she formed a helping hands club with her cousins, brand new club. She reached out and um, it focused on, they focused on making clothing for Italian immigrant children. Oh, that's very nice. Right. She also joined at one of her boarding schools, a Theta Tau. Uh, it was named after the sorority, but it wasn't actually a sorority because it wasn't at a university. Hmm. But there, in that group, she learned about earning badges. That was a very big focus Mm -hmm. throughout her boarding school. In 1880, she graduates. Yeah. And in 1880, her sister dies. No. Which means that she has to return home to Savannah to help manage the household Mm -hmm. while her mother grieves. Yeah. It's that it's at that time that she would meet meet her future husband William Lowe, uh, who was a son of a family friend. Hmm. But William was on his way to Oxford. Okay. So he peaced out in 1880 and went to Oxford. Okay. Juliet helped out around the house, got her mother through the grieving process, and then decided she wanted to travel Europe. As one does. As one does in this time period. (laughs) So she left to travel Europe, where she learned shorthand. She learned how to go bareback riding. She learned uh, hunting skills. She just basically collected all the skills. So she became a young adult lead. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, She ended up in London in 1884, Mm -hmm. where she re-met up with William. And he proposed in 1885. They returned to Savannah to get married on her parents' wedding anniversary, December 21st, 1886. They then honeymooned in in Georgia and moved back to London, uh, buying a house in London and in Scotland where they'd split their time. So they would do the social season in London and the hunting season in Scotland. Yeah. Because that's a thing you do when you're... Of the aristocracy, but that's okay. Uh, (laughs) Due to the weather and Juliet's proclensity for illnesses, they ended up starting to spend more and more time apart. And William was not faithful, Mm. had multiple affairs, and a gambling problem. Is he he a man of the 1800s, or is he a man of the 1800s? (laughs) Um, In any case... uh, it all came to a head in 1901 mm-hmm. when he brought, sorry, when he brought Anna Bridges Bateman, the widow of Sir Hugh Annalee Scaversville Bateman, okay. um, to their house in Scotland mm. and basically started having the affair out in the open. Mm. So Juliet left to stay with friends and family, but did, did they have any children? They did not have any children. Oh, yeah. She she wasn't able to conceive, so mm-hmm. that was another one of those strains yeah. on the marriage. So she left to stay with friends and family, but she was concerned uh, because it is the 1880s that he would ask for a divorce. So she asked him to wait a year mm-hmm. before any decisions were made. 
after that year, he asked to live apart permanently, which she agreed to. He then started withholding money from her. Okay. In an effort to get her to file for divorce. So, in 1902, she spoke with a divorce attorney and Uh learned that, at the time, the only way divorce would be granted is if she proved adultery and abandonment or adultery and abuse. I feel like she got both there. Like, I mean, she definitely got adultery and she got abandonment. Yep. But to prove that... She would have to name Bateman, obviously, Mm. and just generally destroy everybody's reputation. So, but burn it to the ground. Okay, now I understand. It's the early 1900s. Yep. So, in 1903, Juliet and William enter into a support agreement, Mm -hmm. which awards her 2,500 pounds a year, Mm. the home that they own in Savannah, and stocks and securities. All right. Which she then takes the money to purchase a home for herself in London mm-hmm. and a home right next door that she rents out to earn income. All righty. Right? So, to try and avoid damaging everybody's reputation too much, they go about the divorce the slow way. Mm-hmm. Just painfully slow. It comes, and it comes, and it comes, and then in 1905, January 1905, William has a stroke, Mm. Um, or what is possibly a stroke. They don't actually, they aren't able to say that. The historians just presume that it's a stroke based off of everything going on. Yeah. In any case, she pauses the divorce proceedings because it is wrong to seek a divorce from him when he can't defend himself. So she waits. Until he, you know, recovers. And he recovers. And then in June 1905, he has a seizure. And dies. The divorce was never finalized. Well, now she's a widow. (laughs) So now she's a widow. But after the funeral, it's revealed that he had a new will drawn up. (gasps) And left everything to Bateman oh. and had revoked the 1903 support agreement oh. that he had entered into with Juliet. So his sisters and Juliet fight the will. His sisters? His sisters. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you ain't giving it all to your mistress. Particularly because for that time period their parents' estate would have gone entirely to him. So she was getting yeah. all of their parents' estates. So they're like, yeah. no, 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 no. Uh-uh. uh-uh. <laughs> That's not how this works. <laughs> so they fight. And Juliet ultimately receives a chunk, a chunk sum of money. I can't find an exact amount. Mm. The house in Savannah that she had been promised with its surrounding lands and the stocks and securities the support agreement had. Basically, she gets the support agreement plus a lump sum instead of payments. All right. So, while this is going on, she decides, you know what, I'm going to travel again. Mm -hmm. And she takes sculpting classes, and she does charity work, and she learns just basically all, all the more skills. Yeah. All the more skills. So now we get to the meat of her life because she had to like get rid of the useless husband <laughs> to really get going. Um, in May 1911, she met Sir Robert Baden Powell. Okay. At a party. Ooh. Uh, Powell is the founder of the Boy Scouts. Oh, okay, cool. I knew that name. Yep. Uh, at the time, Boy Scouts already had 40,000 members throughout Europe and the United States. Mm hmm. Um, It stressed the importance of military preparedness and having fun. Juliet was so intrigued by it that they became close friends and Mm -hmm. spent a large amount of time together so he could teach her everything that he knew about how he got the Boy Scouts going. In August 2011, Juliet became involved with the Girl Guides, 
Mm -hmm. which was at the time headed by Powell's sister. Okay. Okay. And she formed a Girl Guides troop at that time. They were called uh, Patrols, Girl Guide Patrols, near her home in Scotland. Um, She encouraged the girls to become self-sufficient, learning Mm -hmm. how to spin wool, care for livestock, all those real life things <laughs> or what was real life in the early 1900s yeah um in any case she also organized girl guide patrols in london in the winter of 1911 mm-hmm. so she's going through all this and then in 1912 she packs up and she returns to savannah yeah and she announces to her sister when she gets to savannah that, or sorry, her cousin, Nina, who was a local teacher, mm-hmm. says, I've got something for the girls of Savannah and all of America and the world, and we're going to start it tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shortly after she got, so she got back in the, like, January, February uh-huh. of 1912. By March, she had founded the first two American Girl Guides patrols wow. and had registered 18 girls. Wow. What was most interesting was that she was adamant about there being girls from all races, classes, backgrounds involved. Um, And particularly with it being a place for girls who had disabilities. Ooh. So that was very much the focus, even at the beginning, and who she recruited. Um, <clears throat> she then started just using all of her connections from the various boarding schools that she had bounced around to, and just started like, you're going to do a troop, and you're going to do a troop, and you're going to do a troop, and you're going to bring all your daughters to join, and just kind this of... sounds a lot like you controlling all your introverted friends. <laughs> You're going to do this. You're going to do a thing, and you're going to do a thing. Okay. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And then she would also advertise in newspapers and magazines. She recruited all her family and friends. Mm -hmm. um, And used the connection with Powell to get more people interested. Um, Up to and including uh, Louise Carnegie of that Carnegie family. Ooh, the Carnegies. Yes. Of Carnegie Hall. That's the Carnegie I know. (laughs) That's correct. Uh, So then after forming that, so in 1913, she released the first American Girl Guides manual titled How Girls Can Help Their Country, which was based on the scouting for boys that Powell had written. Um, She then... So she established the first headquarters in the carriage house in the home she had inherited from her Mm -hmm. husband and slowly started to grow. Mm. She would travel all along the East Coast, spreading it to everybody up to and including getting a meeting with President Taft, who was interested in supporting it. She was, however, unsuccessful in getting Taft's daughter, Helen, interested. Because that was what she was really looking for. She was like, if I get the president's daughter in this. uh, (laughs) No, thanks. No, thank you. (laughs) Um, At the time, there were a number of organizations trying to be the Girl Scouts, essentially. Uh Uh, The biggest rival to Juliet's was the... um, Campfire Girls. Cute. Right? Um, Headed by... Oh, God, I just lost his name. James E. West. There we go. A man? Yep. Ew. Uh, Who was the chief executive of Boy Scouts of America at the time. Because Powell was British. right. So he did all the European Boy Scouts... The CEO of the Boy Scouts of America, James West, created the Campfire Girls. And Juliet at one point tried to convince him to merge 
the campfire girls and the girl guides into a single entity. Mm -hmm. And he refused because... Women. No. Oh, okay. Because he was... (laughs) Well, but he was... But he's... West was concerned that many of the activities the girl guides participated in were gender inappropriate. And he was concerned yep. that the public would question the masculinity of the Boy Scouts in they par- if they participated in similar activities. That's why it's called the Boy... Oh, my God. So he's like, no, you don't crochet enough. Yes. You do too much Outdoors. hunting. <laughs> yeah. You, do t- you teach them too much night- knot tying and how to camp and yeah. survive no, 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 on no, their no, own. No, 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 no. This, this can't still be. still ladies. If you do the things the boys do, then the boys are girls. <laughs> Yep, that's not how that works. <laughs> but clearly, that's how it works. So after that, uh, they continued to compete in growth. Campfire Girls was growing at a faster rate, mostly because it was connected to the Boy Scouts network. Yeah. Although Juliet continued to use all of her uh, connections to get them to grow mm-hmm. faster. So Juliet decided she needed to shake things up. So yeah. she returned to London mm-hmm. to try and get some inspiration from the Girl Guide's success back there. Yeah. And she made the determination that really what they needed to do was rename themselves Girl Scouts as opposed to Girl Guides because scouting <laughs> represented the American pioneer ancestry. Mm-hmm. Uh West objected. Naturally. Um, However, because Powell still was the founder, Uh he gave Juliet the blessing to change, to use the name. (laughs) No, 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 no. I like her more than you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Although he did, he, they did keep girl guides for the British version. Ah. Because that just, that made more sense for there. Mm. In any case, uh, she returned, ready to change the name, and she came back to discover that the people she'd left in charge had already changed the name, because they're like, yeah, no, it should have been Girl Scouts all along. we're the Girl Scouts. (laughs) Uh, And she's like, all you guys. (laughs) So, which I thought was really hilarious, yeah. But, so in 1913, when she gets back, name gets changed, and she decides to set up a headquarters in D.C. Okay. And she becomes, you know, she hires a national executive secretary Mm. and they basically, she starts to decide that she needs a centralized and uniformity to make it really grow. Mm -hmm. That's, that was the other big thing that she figured they were missing. So the headquarters became where girls could purchase their badges, get the newly published handbook, how girls help their country, so Mm -hmm. on and so forth. And then she continued to, to recruit, including she met with King George V and Queen Mary of Tech. Uh, she got uh, an honorary committee put together that included Susan Ludlow Parrish, Eleanor mm-hmm. Roosevelt's godmother, mm-hmm. Mina Miller Edison, the wife of Thomas Edison, mm-hmm. Bertha Woodward, wife of... Uh, prominent setter and then just the whole just list of pieces prominent women yes <laughs> in any case that brings us to the start of world war one mm-hmm. so we've we founded the girl scouts have their name they are now the girl scouts of america they have a headquarters in dc everything is growing we're growing we're growing we're growing boy um which, because Juliet can't do any just one thing, yeah, she returns to Scotland and London and starts opening up her homes and finding other people to open up their homes to refugees mm-hmm. and working that. And then she's back, United States side, 1915. And she, by 1915, the Girl Scouts had 73 patrons 2,400 registered members. Mm -hmm. She decided to move 
she decided to create a national committee and a national council. She became the first president Mm -hmm. on June 10th, 1915. They moved their headquarters to New York City from D.C., although they still left a big chunk in D.C. Mm -hmm. And they began to do... So the Girl Scouts taught how to grow, harvest, and can their own food mm. at all of the headquarters and through all of the troops to help with the World War I efforts once the U.S. entered. Mm. They also partnered with the Red Cross to create bandages, mm-hmm. uh, scrapbooks for wounded soldiers, smokeless trench candles for soldiers to heat their food with. Ooh. They created clothing, just generally, like... All the things. Yeah. And so, of course, that's 1915. And while this is occurring, she turned around and went back to England to fundraise and open a home for wounded soldiers where she volunteered three nights a week. And by November, she was back in the United States to continue doing more of this work. Dang, that's a lot of boating. Yeah. She was just kind of like, I'm going to do all the things. I do all the things all at once. (laughs) This lady would be so happy with the invention of the plane. Right. I could not imagine being on a boat. Very much so. Very much so. So, after World War I, it basically became clear that the Girl Scouts were going to be... Campfire Girls basically disappeared. Bye! <laughs> and the Girl Scouts were, were, the, were the, the place to be. Um, particularly with the support of... Edith Bowling Galt Wilson, President Mm -hmm. Woodrow Wilson's second wife, Mm. while she was first lady. She became honorary president. Um, And Lou Henry Hoover became the national vice president. Ah. After World War I, Mm -hmm. Girl Scouts decided to go international. And so Juliet helped to watch them expand and expand and expand. And they merged with the Girl Guides. Okay. Juliet eventually would step down in 1920 so she could devote more of her time to promoting Girl Scouts around the world. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, She attended many meetings of the International Council... She assisted in converting 65 acres into a campsite Mm -hmm. in London, or in Scotland, sorry. And she furnished a house on the property named The Link to show the link between the Girl Guides and the Girl Scouts as a joining Uh event. Uh she appeared in the Gold, Golden Eaglet, mm-hmm. which was the first Girl Scout movie, apparently. Ooh. I did not know this was a thing. Let's find it. Um, <laughs> she created the Girl Scouts convention in uh, Savannah in 1922. Mm-hmm. And after the 1922 convention, she began plan- planning and converting... Uh, Cloudlands Mm -hmm. in Cloudland, Georgia, which is now where the big national camp is. Oh. And it was all basically funded through her. Mm. um, And it's been renamed Camp Juliet Lowe. Oh. In 1923, Juliet developed breast cancer. Mm. But she would keep it a secret till it finally took her life. She caught the flu. And after an operation to remove the malignant lumps, Mm -hmm. she was bedridden until February 1924. Mm -hmm. When she recovered, she resumed her work, continuing to travel back and forth and do all of the things. She would secretly have two more operations to try and cure the breast cancer, Mm -hmm. but was informed in 1925 that she had about six months to live. Yeah. She would then travel to Liverpool to try a uh, experimental treatment. Mm -hmm. 
with an IV containing a solution of colloidal lead. Basically, the first try at chemotherapy. Yep. And so she spent her 66th birthday fighting lead poisoning. Yeah. Because it didn't work. Um, but despite being told in 1925 that she only had six months to live... She and would going con- through lead poisoning. And going through lead poisoning, she would continue to work and fight the cancer until January 17th, 1927. Wow. When she died in her home in Savannah, Georgia. An honor guard of Girl Scouts escorted her casket to her funeral at Christ Church the next day, and 250 Girl Scouts left school early that day to attend oh. her funeral. Oh. Um, her tombstone reads, Now abideth faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Um, she was buried in her Girl Scout uniform with a note in her pocket stating you were not only the first Girl Scout, but the best Girl Scout of them all. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I like this lady. Right? Make a documentary on her. Like a good one. <laughs> um, on May, 9, May 29th, 2012, the centennial anniversary of the Girl Scouts founding was commemorated when Lowe was honored with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, posthumously. Mm. And in 1979, she was inducted in the National Women's Hall of Fame. And that's the story of Juliet Gordon Lowe. Daisy. Daisy. The best Girl Scout of them all. That's cool. Right? Now I wish I was a Girl Scout. (laughs) But people. (laughs) Socializing. You just don't like people. (laughs) Socializing. Can I just learn how to ride a horse bareback without, like, having teen drama? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I don't know. I don't think so. But yes, so yeah, that's the Girl Scouts of America, hmm. founded in Savannah, Georgia, on a demand of I have an idea and it's going to occur tonight. Yep. <laughs> I personally just appreciate the miracles of modern medicine, so that my uh, clumsiness and accident proneness does not cause me an ear infection that goes untreated. Well, causing I me mean, to be just deaf. don't don't get a grain of rice in your ear. I guess. Yeah, but I mean, if you fall in a pile of rice, you oh don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> probably is what happened. <laughs> or she was like reaching up to get the rice container. <laughs> probably, that seems more likely for me. I don't know. <laughs> <It's> just <laughs> a grain of rice. <laughs> One grain, not two. Yeah, no, I, and that is all that I can find is just it's due to an untreated ear inf- an untreated infection and a grain of and a small grain a small grain of rice. Is and a small grain of rice. That's what's getting me. Yeah, not like caused by a small grain of rice <laughs> and a small grain of rice. I I don't know. I, I, that's that is the wording. That is the wording I got. Um, so citations, obviously the Georgia Women's Hall of Fame, the National Women's Hall of Fame, uh, art entry on, uh, Juliet Gordon Lowe by Dr. Kelly A. Spring, uh, the Girl Scouts of America, the Girl Scouts.org, um, have a great article on Juliet Gordon Lowe, uh, Wikipedia, cause it's always my friend. Um, the, an article by Majori Kehi, mm-hmm. that crazy Daisy who started the Girl Scouts in the Christian Science Monitor. Mm. And the book, Juliet Gordon Lowe, the remarkable founder of the Girl Scouts by Stacy Cordery. Um, I found it on Google Books. Because I'm cheap. (laughs) Um, As well as the ebook entitled Juliet Gordon Lowe, The First Girl Scout by Donna Herwick 
Rice. Also found on Google Books. Yay, Yay Google Books. Yay, Google Mm -hmm. Books. So, Jessica. Yes. Where can people find you if they want to talk about being an introvert and wanting to learn skills without having to meet people? (laughs) You can find me on Twitter as J.M. Bailey Writes. If you have a suggestion for where she can learn this stuff through YouTube so she doesn't have to talk to other people, she'd probably appreciate that. (laughs) I'm going to probably have to get a horse. (laughs) (laughs) And you can reach me with the rest of Geek Elite Media at Geek Elite Media on our Facebook page forward slash Geek Elite Media. Archived episodes of this podcast and other podcasts can be found on our website, geekelitemedia.com. Please remember to rate and review us on whatever podcatcher you use to help spread the word. But until next time, this is the ladies from United States of Women saying always remember to geek, geek out. out. This concludes our broadcast. Beep.